ProChan is a reimbursement service for uh, the home-based care industry, the home care industry. Uh, we work with DME providers, home infusion providers, and we're expanding now into home health and hospice. So we're very much focused on serving the home-based um, care community. Um, what does it mean? So it's a word we made up. Oh, I it was your title. I oh, no, I wish. Know. But you know, when you're naming a company nowadays, you want to have the, the dot com, right? But all the dot coms are taken. So anyways, what you do now is you make up a word. And you guys know there's a lot of companies like that. So we made up ProChant. Um, our, our, we used to be called Prometheus Group. So that's where the PRO came from. And then Chant. Uh, we think of revenue cycle management as like a chant, like a rhythmic chant, because you do it over and over again, and, and you get better and better every time, and it gets stronger, and we do it in mass. There's thousands of us doing these, these chants to bring you money, to bring in that money, get those orders processed, get that AR work, get that cash posted. Uh, that's what we do. So um, my history, I actually call myself a child of the DME industry. I say that because my father was a regional sales manager for a DME company when I was growing up. So we had a lift chair in our living room. We had uh, a concentrator in our Florida room. My dad had CPAPs in his trunk. And so like, I grew up around the stuff. And as soon as I graduated high school, they brought me in and made me a service technician. And I worked in the warehouse, and I was cleaning commodes and walkers and crutches. And I was um, filling oxygen tanks. And you know, I, I started at the bottom, right? And I learned the equipment. I learned how you set it up. Then I took 24-hour on-call. I was on the road. I was helping patients in the middle of the night, screwing in those Christmas trees on the concentrators when they were cross-thread and it started alarming, or helping people plug in the machine because they forgot to plug it in and it wouldn't start. You know, all those fun things. Um, eventually, I moved into uh, customer service and intake, and then eventually, I moved into billing and collections. Um, throughout that time, I was going to college, and once I got my master's, my MBA, I became the director of operations for that company. And so um, in that role, I was over everything but sales and marketing. And um, eventually, I got picked up by Brighttree. Brighttree made me a senior consultant. I got to travel the country working with providers just like yourselves, not only implementing the software, but solving business challenges. Um, and eventually, one of their customers hired me to be their vice president of revenue cycle. And so that's how I, that company got um, acquired by what's now Adapt Health. And, um, ProChant was our billing service, so I was able to come from having been a client to now running ProChant. I'm very excited to be here and working with it and working with you all. So thanks for having me here. This is my fourth Heartland, um, and again, it's one of my favorite conferences of the year. I really look forward to it every year. All right, so today we're going to be talking about resupply. We're going to start by talking about product lines. Then we're going to get into workflow. Then we're going to get into technology. Um, then Rhonda's going to take us through some payer-specific and product-specific guidelines. And finally, we're going to wrap up with some do's and don'ts. Okay? So first, product lines. So have you guys ever seen these things before on a horse? So these are called blinders, right? Anybody know why you put a blinders on a horse? So it doesn't see what's going on beside it. it That's right. It. it doesn't get distracted. It just looks straight ahead, and you can kind of keep it going straight ahead. That's why you put those blinders on. I have a feeling that our industry has blinders on when it comes to resupply, and the only thing we see in front of us is CPAP. CPAP resupply, CPAP resupply, it's all we talk about, it's all the technology, it's everything we focus on is CPAP resupply. Meanwhile, there's all these other product lines that are eligible for resupply that we're just not putting energy into. So that's my first point I want to make here is that when you think about your resupply program, please don't only think about CPAP. Obviously, CPAP's a really important part of that, but it's not the only part of that. And I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to maximize resupply revenue in our business. You know, anything that we sell that's a consumable, we could think of as a resupply item. So there's things that even are on this list, and I'm curious what other thoughts you guys would have. Other product lines that are eligible for resupply that maybe aren't listed here. So we've got urologicals, ostomy supplies, diabetic supplies, trach supplies, incontinence, enteral and parenteral nutrition, mastectomy, um, TENS, wound care, pharmacy meds like NEB meds, maybe us are still in that game. Um, but what else? What else is out there that's a consumable that we could think of as a resupply product line? Yeah. Uh, breast pump storage bags. Breast pump storage bags. That's a great idea. Nobody said that before. Because Rhonda and I have done this presentation a few times. Yes. Nobody said that before, so I love that. You're the winner. You're the winner. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what, but you're the winner. <laughs> How about back here? Compression socks. 
Compression stockings, yes, that's a great answer. Compression stockings could be thought of as a resupply product line. What else, any other thoughts? Resupply product lines in your business? Consumables that you sell? I think about like, let's say I have a retail store and I'm doing supplements, dietary supplements, or even CBD oil or something like that in my retail store. I mean, is patient pay a payer? It absolutely is, right? Why can't I think of that as a product line that's eligible for resupply, getting those patients there? you know, their, uh, their vitamins on a regular basis. Think, you know, you guys ever do an Amazon subscribe and save? I swear, my wife loves to do that because you get, what, 15% off on the first order, but then they just keep shipping it, right, unless you cancel it. So why, why give them all that? Why don't we do a subscribe and save? That's, that's good, right? That's why we do this stuff. Any other thoughts, product lines, eligible for resupply? Yeah. It's called MedSync. The supply of meds. And, yeah. You, know, you get the person that isn't compliant, and they find they have four jars. But, uh, yeah. But yeah, that's. So for pharmacies, he mentioned a product called MedSync. That might be a great technology to look at, because um, it sounds like it does a, it does multiple different medications, prescription and non-prescription. The best thing for the pharmacy is you get to reset, you get to do it every four weeks as opposed to every thirty days. So you actually get thirteen billing cycles. There you go, every four weeks instead of every 30 days for that program. So, um, so yeah, there's a lot. I mean, if we just start to open our minds a little bit, there's a lot of opportunity out there for us to do more resupply than just CPAP, okay? So now let's talk about workflow. Workflow um, is basically, this is how we get patients enrolled in our resupply program. So it starts out, you see here at the top, it starts out I've got a new patient who comes in and they get an order from me and I fill that order. Maybe it's not even a new patient, maybe it's an existing patient, but they get an order from me on a product line that's eligible for resupply. So is that patient, is this a resupply eligible product line? And we've got to take off those blinders because it may be, although we may not think of it as that right now, um, if it is, then that patient gets enrolled in a resupply campaign based on the payer and product. So what is a campaign? A campaign defines the frequency and the quantity of resupply orders. So the big example we all probably know by heart now is for Medicare CPAP, we do 90-day resupplies. We do that because they can get a mask every 90 days, right? Um, and so that's like we, put, we put these patients in a campaign, and also a lot of other payers follow that same cadence. Every 90 days we can send a mask, we can send the other supplies, you know, you can do a headgear every six months. Do we send one every other order or do we just go ahead and send the headgear every time? That's a, sort of a business decision that you guys make. It certainly isn't a reason, I think, to skip that second 90 day, right? Um, and then, uh, so, so, but there's other ones, right? Sometimes our Medicaid's require 30 day resupplies. Sometimes other payers have different requirements. Sometimes they'll go even longer than 90 days. So you create these campaigns, and the key is that we have our patients automatically enrolled in these campaigns just because they got it from us, or they got the core product from us. Like we do a CPAP setup, so they get put in the CPAP resupply campaign. Um, so we have to think through what are the core products that might go out, because obviously the CPAP is a rental, um, but if they get that, then obviously they need the supply, so we're gonna put that patient in the resupply campaign. Um, and then finally, um, we're going to have a dedicated resupply team consistently executing on our campaign. That is the key, a dedicated resupply team. This is not your normal intake team. And this is critical. Why? Because a new order, a new setup, a stat discharge will always take precedence, won't it? That always wins. And so if I have my team who does intake, and now I've also got them managing my resupply, Guess what goes on the back burner? The resupply, every time. So you have, to have, you have to carve that out. That has to be a separate team that focuses on nothing but resupply. And it's critical because this is an important part of your revenue. I mean, some providers have 20 to 50% of their revenue coming from resupply alone. So it's a critical com component, but it's not as urgent as the patient who's trying to get out of the hospital, trying to get discharged, and the nurse keeps calling saying, where are you guys at? Right? So we've got to make sure it's a separate team so they can focus and they can be successful at this. So executing on our campaigns. We get the patient, they automatically get enrolled in our campaign. This chart's going to show you sort of the happy path of an order walking through that campaign. 
And of course, we have to make sure we build out our system to, to manage it because not every order follows the happy path, right? In fact, there's always exceptions, there's always weird things that come up. But in general, this is the happy path that we want our orders to follow. First thing that happens, 30 days out, we do proactive prescription management. That is the key. 30 days out, proactive CMN or prescription management. The number one reason that you can't fill a resupply order is because you don't have an active prescription. You don't have a prescription within 12 months, this is, which is what we mean. So if you don't have a prescription within 12 months, a lot of times you can't fill the order. You're now chasing the doctor, trying to get that back. And then you find out they haven't seen the doctor. They got to go see the doctor so you can get the order. And it's this whole thing, right? And it, it causes issues. That's why we start 30 days out. We, we try to get that thing signed. Doctor comes back, says, I haven't seen the patient. Now we're going to loop in that patient. Hey, we got to get you in to see that doctor. Maybe even help them schedule that appointment. Remind them, you know, like it just, the, how far you take it is up to you. But that's critical. We got to get that CMN on file. and We want to get that done proactively. Then, seven to 14 days out, we start calling and messaging our patient, depending on payer guidelines. Some payers let us go 14 days out. Some only let us go seven days out. But we start to call that patient to go ahead and, and get them to make that reorder. Um, and of course, we don't get through the first time. We leave voicemails. We send text messages. We send emails. Whatever we can get to get that patient to say, yes, I want that resupply order. Great, so the patient requests the resupply order. That now gets routed to my scrubbing team. That's what we call it in our, in our world. So at ProChant, we help providers manage this process. So it goes to our scrubbing team, or your scrubbing team. And that team works through a checklist. I'm actually gonna walk you through that checklist in a few minutes. But there's gonna be a checklist that they walk through. Things like, do I have an active prescription? Do I have a prior authorization? Does the insurance still verify as eligible? Even looking at things like, did they pay their last bill? Right? Did the payer, did I get paid on the last shipment? Because if I didn't, then maybe I don't want to send another one. You know? I'm really going to do some, some digging before I send that next one. Um, because the last thing you want to do is throw good money after bad money, right? Yeah. Now we've got our resupply checklist been worked. It gets routed to the fulfillment team. So a lot of us use third party fulfillment. Uh, VGM has an amazing fulfillment branch. Um, there's other fulfillment options out there. And we're going to actually talk about some of those options today. But it's going to go to the, or maybe it's in-house. Maybe we ship this stuff in-house. Maybe we have the patients come pick it up. Um, then it's, we're going to fill that order. And we're going to make sure that we write that tracking number back into our billing system, the tracking number from the shipment if it went out through a shipment. Otherwise, we just get that proof of delivery like we always do with the signature on it. And then finally, it goes to our billing team. And they're going to go ahead and um, review that proof of delivery. If there's an ABN, get that reviewed, get it built. So that's the happy path. Right? We start 30 days out on each patient, and then we work it, work it, work it, get that order filled. And this is a continuous process that every single day we manage. Our dedicated resupply team manages. Yeah. Yeah. Would you all agree 30 days is enough time, or do any of you go, you go 60 days out or 45 days out, start contacting the doctor for making sure that the prescriptions are valid or the patient needs to get in to see the physician? Does anybody start differently than our 30 days? I think it's a pretty good timeline. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, good. And of course, we have to be able to handle those exceptions. You know, like what if the doctor won't fill the, the order because, uh, or the doctor won't sign the prescription because the patient hasn't seen them? Well, now we have a process for that. We're going to help that patient get an, an a appointment scheduled. We're going to bug that patient. We might even schedule the appointment for him and say, hey, we made an appointment for you with Dr. Jones next week. Um, so, uh, people literally have done that. I'm not just making this stuff up. So in each one of these, you go like, what, what if I run into an issue? At the scrubbing team, we always run into issues, right? Where the insurance is no longer valid, right? So now they've changed insurance. So now that's got to go back to the calling team to contact the patient, find the new coverage. Hey, I know you made this, this order, um, but your insurance has changed. We need to find out the new insurance information. So you, you know, each one of these, you sort of think of what are the exceptions that could happen and make sure you have a process to handle that. Now, I'm not gonna, don't worry. This is just, I want you to see, this is what the chart looks like. This is what the overall process flow looks like. It's got the swimming lanes for the different teams that are doing their piece. You know, I mentioned the, uh, the scrub team, that's right here, it's the scrub team. So, but this is sort of like an overview of what that process could look like. And um, it's in the handouts. So um, you wanna make this for you. What does this look like in your business and for your different product lines? As we zoom in on that a little bit, because I told you I wanted to talk through that checklist with you that the scrub team has to work. 
So in this, you can see, um, first we start with our proactive CMN management up here at the top. They're trying to get that CMN back, moves to the scrub team. So they're gonna run through this checklist. So the checklist starts with looking at the notes to see are there any issues they need to know about, uh, verify that the address is still correct, review the financial history and notes and holds, right? Do, what happened with the last claim? Did it pay? Did it deny? What's going on? Should I go ahead and proceed with this or should I do some more investigation? Review the order history, make sure that we're not going too soon. Do we need to run the same similar check? Make sure that we're not shipping too soon or they didn't already receive something. Uh, verify that eligibility, make sure it's still active coverage. Uh, verify that the products match. You know, a lot of times this happens where you get a re renewal order from like your resupply vendor, but then the orders, the products ordered don't match the products that are filled last time. So you gotta kind of resolve that. Verify that my CMN is active. Verify that my authorization is still active and still has units. And if not, go ahead and request that authorization, get that on file, add notes to my billing system, key in the sales order, or maybe it flows right in um, through automation. Uh, verify the auto pay status. Is this a situation? So a lot of us, we wanna get that payment up front from the patient before we ship. So what is the, the estimated out of pocket? Um, is there an auto pay on file where we can just go ahead and bill that? Or do we need to contact the patient and get that um, auto pay agreed to. Um, calculate the out-of-pocket, ensure all work list items, and then go ahead and send that off to our, our next team. So um, again, you can look through this on the, the, um, the handouts, but this just kind of gives you an idea of what that process would look like when I'm flowing my orders, I got my patients going to these campaigns, and I'm managing my campaigns now. This is that second part of the chart, and again, you guys can look at that. But um, the last, yeah, go ahead. Sure. Flow chart real quick. Is there at any point in that process like actually contacting the patient before you do all that work? Like do you find that yeah. beneficial? So this is the coach. I mean, it seems like oh. a lot of work to do to find out that, you know, maybe So like the proactive CMN management. Is that what you mean? So the question was, do you contact the patient first before we start this process? So in the way we manage it, no. Like we're gonna go ahead and try and get that CMN initially proactively without contacting the patient. Um, now, we're not gonna get like a prior authorization in advance because that wouldn't be right. You know, the patient has choice, they may decide to go elsewhere for this resupply order. But me getting an order from the doctor isn't gonna hamper that. Um, now, once I've got that order, then that seven to 14 days out, that's when we contact the patient. So there is, we don't wait. And that's because after doing thousands and thousands of orders, we realized that the number one reason things were not shipping was the CMN wasn't there. So we felt, Get, on, get in front of that um, 30 days out. And I think that that part is important just when, just speaking even from a personal experience, I've, I've had pharmacies call me to say meds are ready to find out if there's not a valid order and prior auth isn't ready. Well, why'd you call me then, <laughs> right? So yeah, I think that's. Right, and that way when you make that call, like let's say the doctor won't sign because they haven't been in, now when you call the patient you can say, we need to make sure you get in to see the doctor so we can get this order filled. So it helps us with the talk track when we have that initial conversation with the patient. All right, so um, technology. So there's a lot of technology out there that's uh, available to help us manage through this. Um, I am not being paid by or advocating for any of these. I wanna be clear about that. Um, this is in no way a sales pitch. You guys have your vendors that you love and I encourage you to work with them. Um, the, the important pieces of technology that we're working with here are, of course, your billing system or your EMR. And I have up here sort of the main billing systems in our industry. These five are the main billing systems in our industry. I would say that these five control 95 plus percent of the market, maybe more. So most of us are in one of these systems. Um, then you've got your resupply system, your campaign manager. Now, some of these are specific just to CPAP. Right? So we have to keep that in mind. And some of these have gone a little deeper. For instance, Bright Trees Connect will manage multiple product lines, not just CPAP. Bright Tree also owns Snapworks, which is very much focused on CPAP. Um, other ones out there, Sleep Coaches, S3. If you guys look at your lanyards, you should recognize S3. Um, so those are some of the resupply systems or campaign managers. Um, and then you've got the outreach providers as well. So a lot of times that's combined, like with Sleep Coaches and S3, um, and even Bright Tree Connect, they own all call. So they're gonna do that calling for you. Um, or you can do the calling yourself 
or you like Bright Tree Connect will allow you to create those call lists and then your team it actually has the script right there on the screen. Your team would go ahead and make those calls and complete the order through Bright Tree. Um, and then you've got your dropship vendors, finally. So your dropship vendors um, here, VGM Fulfillment obviously is a great choice. They're very much focused on the CPAP space right now. Um, you've also got McKesson and Independence out there. Those are both, um, they'll do CPAP, but they'll do pretty much anything else as well. So those are nice options when you're doing non-PAP related um, fulfillment. I would say a lot of providers nowadays are using fulfillment partners. They're not keeping the stuff in-house. They're not shipping from in-house. It's become very, very popular. All the big companies, like the big, big companies, they all use third-party shippers. Um, they don't warehouse this stuff. So um, it's definitely something to think about if it's not something that you're currently doing in your business. So any thoughts, questions about the technology, the process flow before I turn it over to Rhonda to talk about the guidelines? Yeah, Rhonda's got a lot of talk to her. She said, are you talking about the assignment of benefits? Oh, uh, I don't know if we're talking about that, but. We'll see where it goes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. All right, so now we get into the fun part, right? We get to talk about the payers. <laughs> no, no. There's a lot of challenges with a lot of the payers. I know we tend to talk a lot of Medicare, and we sometimes balk at Medicare. But the good thing about Medicare, we know where to go to get their guidelines. We know where they exist. We may not like them. There may be interpretation issues, but at least we know they exist and we can talk it out. These other payers, what are their guidelines? Yeah. Medicare. <laughs> yeah, and, and their canned answer is we follow Medicare guidelines when it's convenient for them. They forget to put that in front right, Not that we've read them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so the point of it is, is to make sure that you understand and know where these payer guidelines are. I know that um, many of the big payers will have websites that will have their policies on, on their websites, um, but just calling and talking to someone at these payers, uh, you know, a representative there, I would not take those words that they share with you like it's the Bible. Like, I would not, right? I'm sure you've experienced that where they don't know what they're talking about. They're just, they've only been trained on certain things, they only know so much, um, and they're just sharing what they know, basically, which is not much. Um, but it's our job, if we're going to be submitting these claims for these patients, is to know what these guidelines are and to find these guidelines online or ask the payers, where are your guidelines? Can you share those with me? Where is it at on, on the websites? I do help myself and I have my work colleague Craig will help find guidelines for any, any of you, but it's just important to know these. When in doubt, you can always default to a Medicare guideline, right? That's what I always did when I was a supplier. We just defaulted to a Medicare guideline because we knew we were at least safe. We probably had more than what we needed, but that's fine. I'd rather have that than not enough because of these other payers. Also knowing your contracts with these payers. We see a lot, we have these discussion boards um, on our member only portal and I see that I don't see all of it all the time because it's, it's a lot of discussion, which is great. But there's a lot of questions sometimes about all these other payers. And what you have to remember is every contract it has its own personality, right? So your contract with the payer is going to be different than someone else. So it's important to, to know that, that just because you have an issue, someone else may not have that same issue. Um, just, it, just keep that in mind, that you, you have to know your contract and know what it says in there. That's a great point. Commercial contracts are varied across the provider base, yes. even from a single payer. It can be. So you've got to know your, your contract and what's in there. Policy-wise, generally, they're about the same, but it's still good to know what those policy requirements are. Like Joey had said earlier, some of these payers um, may allow a 90-day shipment for a patient, and some may not. You just need to know what they are. Most of them, I feel like, are doing that, other than like a Medicaid. Those are generally 30-day, right? Anything, anybody else have seen a 30-day option? Giha, uh, I just got an email this morning. What was it? Giha, um, G-E-H-A. It kind of plan is it like a commercial? It's, yeah, it's a commercial okay. yeah. plan, but they do 30 days. Yeah. And there's reasons sometimes behind that because someone said earlier, the patients forward things, right? You want to make sure that they're using the products. I know when I was a supplier, I don't know how many times I when someone opened things or stashed them in the closet. <laughs> um, also know what their refill requirements are. If, they, if you have to document and collect that request for re refill that we have to do when it's a Medicare patient or even a called disadvantage plan, Medicare disadvantage plan. <laughs> Isn't disadvantage much more fun? <laughs> um, but you 
have to know what their refill guidelines are. Some may not even require it, or some may, and it's, it's even hard to find those guidelines, I know. We have a supplier we're working with trying to help find some guidelines for a certain payer. But um, these, pay and the reason I keep stressing this, how many of you are in audits with a commercial plan or, or a disadvantage plan? Because if you're not, I'm surprised. I hear that so much more right now. With It's not just Medicare doing audits, all these other payers are. And they've gotten to where they're doing prepay audits, like Medicare does now. Like the local DME Max will do prepay. Their audits have amped up, so it's so important to know these plans, um, what their requirements are, because they, they want your money. They're hungry. They want your money. Keep in mind, just because you submit a claim doesn't mean it was a successful claim, right? You have to make sure that policy has been followed and that, pay, that claim is paid properly. As Joey even talked about, we have to prove continued need. So we, we get so focused when a patient initially gets a product from us that we get the um, initial requirements met, but we always have to prove that ongoing need because we have to make sure the patient still medically needs it and obviously they're using it. That's with that order that Joey talked about in that flow chart. Getting that order is generally enough for supply items. You don't, not all plans require a patient to go in and see the doctor. And then those, also know your specific guidelines. I get questions all the time about what order requirements are. Each state governs that. So our, when you have a supplier number, the supplier number and the supplier standards say you have to follow your state guidelines. Well, that means also for the prescriptions. So you have to know what your state laws are from the, from the Board of Pharmacy. Most of them are the same you'll find, but you still need to know those and if, where they're at. And there's thousands of pages within them. But if you work with your state associations, a lot of times they, they can help you with, with that. Um, I've tried sometimes when I have time to do it. But, but it's just important to know your state guidelines. I'm gonna go ahead and All right. <laughs> um, we kind of talked about this a little bit. Um, knowing your the payer guidelines, uh, thankful for Medicare having guidelines online that we can um, look up. Uh, what else is in here? Knowing changes, when there's changes coming about because um, that's important to know when there's a change in a policy, what you still have to, what you have to start doing to collect the re resupply information from these patients. It's so important to be um, within the guidelines. Um, so what is a clean claim definition? Clean claim, what that is, is, and the reason this is all important to this is knowing the policies and, and getting all the information correctly. The clean claim is one that you submit and it gets paid timely. It doesn't develop, it doesn't deny, it doesn't reject. It gets paid timely, like there's no hiccups in it. Um, and it gets paid on time, whatever that payer's guidelines are for paying you all on time. So that's a clean claim. A lot of them will not process cleanly. They'll put what they call dirty claims. And that's because they'll reject, usually that's a reject or denials because there's been an issue on the claim submission. But if they don't pay on time, then they'll develop them and that's where, that's where the audits come into play. It's so important to know what codes require prior off. Um, even just calling these payers and asking, hey, does it, these require prior off and some of these resupplies? They may tell you they don't. Come to find out they do, right? Because these people that you call are just, they don't understand the, the policy requirements. So it's important to know um, what payers would have a prior off requirement. I don't know if there's software, if there's still softwares out there that help with that, like know what a prior, when a prior off is due for certain payers or is there anything like that? I mean, you can certainly code that into your billing system. Like if you use Brighttree, you can put that in your price tables that a prior auth is required. So it'll flag that order line that you need a prior auth. That would be good. Yeah. yeah. So anything that you can flag your team to capture so <coughs> they're not cleaning up on the back end of it. You want that clean claim, right? Um, then you want to look at what my big thing too is reauthorization. I know we've talked about this quite a bit, reauthorizations, because you have to know when a reauthorization is due and who's responsible for capturing that. Um, we've had discussions in some of our other sessions we've done, who's responsible for getting a reauthorization? Where does that come? Is that the front end staff, your intake team, or the back end, the billing team, or, who, or is there just a dedicated team that does reauth? Hopefully you can have a dedicated team that does the reauth because there are gonna be a lot of those, right? And then you're capture, capturing them ahead of time so that cash flow just keeps going, that it doesn't stop, and then you have another report you have to work because you've had some offs on hold. That's right, that dedicated resupply team should be focused on getting these reauthorizations and renewal CMNs. So the last thing you want is that stuff going to your, your normal intake team, because again, it's gonna go on the back burner. When, when you're talking teams, yep. what size of companies are you talking about? How, what size is your team? He said, when we're talking teams, what size team are we talking about? 
you know, it, it scales up, right? So we work with providers that are, you know, one location, handful of people, and the whole company, right? Including the owner who's out there on the road half the time delivering. And on the other hand, you know, we work with some of the largest companies in the industry with thousands of people. So it really, it scales up, right? So, so like, well, you can't have a dedicated team when you have one CSR would be the point, right? I have one customer service rep or two. There's no way I'm going to have a dedicated resupply team. The way you handle that is through time blocking. So we have to say that there's a certain time on a certain day, maybe Tuesdays and Thursdays between three and five, we're taking one of our customer service reps and they're gonna focus on resupply. And we're, the owner's gonna answer the phones during that time so that they can just focus on resupply. So that's how we sort of handle that with a smaller provider. Yeah. That answered my question. Yep. When I was one, I was a smaller provider too, and so my staff wore a lot of hats and we did just that. We did time blocking for whatever their roles entailed so they had time to work on it. We, we worked it out with them, say what all do you have on your plate to do and how can we block it? It may not be every day that that time is blocked for certain things, but it, it was throughout the week. Um, nowadays, if I was still managing there, I'd be looking at technology <laughs> to be my best friend, <laughs> to uh, make sure that I didn't have to put so much on my staff's plate like that. Yeah. There's a lot of good tools out there right now. So um, We've already talked about audits. So let's talk a little bit about the refill. I know we've talked a little bit about the allowance of it all but and the contact of the patients, but it's so important to know these guidelines and, and keep your team up to date on them um, and make sure that you have this information in your medical record. When we talk about drop shipping, when an audit occurs, whoever that um, company or insurance is that's auditing you, they will ask for this information because they, a lot of them don't always allow automatic drop ships. I know there are some that out there that allow, the, the payers will allow that, but not all of them allow it. So they'll, re, they'll request this information that you've actually contacted, or whoever you have contacting the patient, and that they actually um, need the product. And a tracking number isn't sufficient for proof of delivery. That's important to remember as well. And the, the common carriers reuse those tracking numbers. So it's important that you have a process to go ahead and get, get that confirmation screen from the, you know, from UPS or, you know, Postal Service or whoever and make sure that that's uploaded to the chart or if you're working with one of these shippers, they will a lot of times get that for you. So just important that you take the next step with your proof of delivery. Otherwise, in an audit, you could be in a bad situation. Another reason why people work with these third-party shippers is to deal with this kind of stuff because this comes up constantly. Imagine how many returns Amazon has to process every day, right? So it's just, they have a process for it. When you know, somebody says, you've got proof of delivery, you even got a picture of the package there on their porch, and they say they didn't get it, you know, um, it's, a, it's a big pain. So we work with companies like VGM Fulfillment, McKesson, Independence to manage that for us. Get, you know, do a new shipment, don't charge us twice. My FedEx guy takes pictures every time he delivers something. Even if I'm standing there, he still takes a picture of it that he, should, he delivered it. Yeah. <laughs> Leaving yep. it on my front porch doesn't mean it's going to be there when I get home. Right. Yeah, porch pirates are a real thing. <laughs> Even more and more prevalent nowadays. Yeah. yeah. All right. This are, yeah, we talked all, all, about a lot, a lot of this already. Excuse me, I've had lots of caffeine already today. <laughs> a lot of this already about what you can get for continued need, and we push the order on these situations because of the supply type items that you have. That's the best way to capture it. Um, unless it's like you said, the doctor is requiring the patient to come in, then you would get the follower's um, guidelines with the doctor. Also keep in mind, you can fill out that order. You don't have to call the doc and say, hey, the patient needs a new order. Fill it out in your billing system and send it over to the doctor. Now they have to do is sign it. By them signing it, it means they agree to it. If they want to change anything, they can change it at that time. So that's the best way to do it because they don't know everything we need. So just complete everything, have it sent over. Um, and that signature. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. I mean, anybody ever get a script back there? They checked off the full face and the uh, yeah. half mask. Yeah. You go, oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just fill it out. They don't understand our requirements. Make it easy. Just a couple of things for you, like for ostomy and urological, and even I think you saw on the other side with CGMs, you don't have to worry about getting all this documentation for continued need. Believe it or not, once they have an ostomy or urological supply, they can prove continued need based off of that initial requirement. So the point of this too is just to know your policy requirements because they, they just added those in in the last few years. So it could change for other policies too. So now we start to kind of summarize some of our points here, right? First one is um, 
So can the billing system be used to, to incorporate these guidelines? Like how do we prompt our people at the time and not make them go you know, dig through SOPs or read through our file server or whatever, right? So, so it's really leveraging that billing system. And I would guess many of us in the room are using Brighttree. Um, and if not, even the others have some of this functionality where you can put in like quantity limits, for instance, um, on like an authorization as an example, um, where you can take away from, you know, they're gonna allow 100 units in this authorization and then every time it takes away and it lets you know when you've exceeded the allowed uh, max. Also, you can put in quantity limits so it stops you from shipping like two masks as an example or, you know, 10 cushions or whatever. It'll tell you, hey, that's too many. So um, putting some, some effort into that setup, um, even if they don't have core functionality for some of this stuff, there's something called custom validation rules in Brighttree that um, is just wide open, flexible. Any, any hick pick payer combination you can think of, you can write rules that will trigger on the sales order to remind your team to do stuff. And you can have those rules do things like stop them from even printing a ticket, it'll stop the delivery, um, or it'll stop confirmation, or it'll just be informational. So you have those three options whenever you configure these custom validation rules. So I think one of the most important things we can do is put this knowledge base into our system so that our people get reminded when it's important because they're not going to remember all the time, especially with the turnover that we have. You know, customer service is generally an entry level position anyways. So there's not a ton of knowledge in that seat to start with. So the more we can enable our team by putting that stuff into our billing system, the better we're going to be. Um, leveraging automation, right? So that's why all these um, resupply programs and campaign managers have gotten so much traction, especially thinking about something like Snapworks, um, where there's a tremendous amount of automation in that system. But it's all about, remember the first thing I said is, when a patient gets an eligible item, uh, an item that's eligible for resupply, they get automatically enrolled in a campaign. So they didn't have to opt in, nobody had to remember, nobody had to go run a report, it happened automatically, right? So that's where these systems come in that we've talked about, um, or there's other options when it comes to automation. You know, Automation isn't as much of a out there kind of dreamy thing anymore, right? I mean, it's become more and more real and more and more at our fingertips. There's technology called RPA, Robotic Process Automation, that literally allows you to point and click program a bot to do things for you like this. So like when I said run a report, and then put the patient on a list. Like, let's say you're gonna do a urological campaign, right? And you don't have the tools, you don't have an automated system to do urological campaigns. You can actually program a bot simply. You don't have to know coding. You can simply point and click, train a bot to ramp up at night, run the report, enter those patients into the resupply sheet or whatever it is that we use to manage that campaign. Um, can the billing system allow for decision support? So that's again, like putting our cheat sheets and our decision trees you know, using custom validation rules to actually put some of the language from the LCD there, like, you know, to, to remind people, this is what it needs to say, this is what we need to have in order for us to be compliant. Um, and of course, are there vendor partners that can allow to streamline that technology, which we've talked about? Everything from purchasing, ordering, shipping, contacting the patients, um, and then looking, you know, even beyond that. So companies like Prochant can help you with like the, the scrubbing team and um, that dedicated resupply team. So there's a lot of options out there to help you sort of get automation in place, get vendor partners in place to help you not have to remember all this stuff because it's a lot to remember uh, when you're trying to you know, just manage these inbound patients and these urgent discharges and the rest of your business and HR issues. You know, it's a lot that happens. So we've got to really enable ourselves as much as possible with technology and with vendor partners. So some do's and don'ts. Um, this is a big one for you, Rhonda, right? Be careful shipping yeah. across state lines. Make sure you know your, each state's guidelines. If, if you're starting to ship regularly across state lines, that you're following those state guidelines, what, whatever they may be for that product. And there may not be any, but you need to make sure you're following the guidelines if you're going into other states. It's perfectly fine to do it, but just know that. Yeah, there are certain states that require you have a location in that state for you to provide um, anything to the a patient in that state. Like I think Tennessee is one of them. Yep. Alabama. Yeah. So also just make sure you also, if you're shipping to other states, make sure you have, if you're in PECOs or if you do the hard copy of your 855S, that's updated to reflect that. They've really been hammering on making sure 
how you do your business that it reflects what you have in PECOs that governs your P10 number. So really make sure that you're doing that, especially now that they have the new contractor for uh, east of the Mississippi. For some reason, it, not just them, but both contractors are really hammering on, on these requirements. Um, I've heard this a few times. So it doesn't hurt to review that on a regular basis to make sure it's up to date. You can make these changes at any time. There's no specific time frame that you have to do it, like the first of the year, the end of the year. Whenever there's a change, you can make those changes. That's right. And sales tax, believe it or not, is still an issue in certain yeah. states. Like, is it Washington State yeah. where you have to collect sales tax? No? So uh, still, not now, you, you've always had to. And I think they're one of the last holdouts. Illinois still has Illinois to. as well? Yeah. Illinois, they have a high-low. It's ridiculous. It's a mess in Illinois. But that's a messy. I can say Does that. Does Illinois way. Medicaid still send IOUs <laughs> instead of checks? <laughs> that used to be the case, right? I, I, I got those. I don't, I don't know. Anybody from Illinois, do you get IOUs? <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Well, it's gotten a little better. That's good to hear. It used to be everything was an IOU. It was I nuts. I wanted to drop that Medicaid for that reason, and my hospital would let me, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we talked about automating campaign enrollment. We talked about having a, a dedicated team or time blocking. If we don't have a large enough team to have a, a solely dedicated resupply team. Um, and of course, partnering with the right vendors. So in summary, take off your CPAP blinders. There's a lot more to resupply than just PAP. Get a grip on your workflow, especially your campaign management and execution. Enlist the right technology partners. Um, keep your payer policies assemble, um, accessible and updated. And if possible, put that stuff in your billing system. Bake it right into your billing system so that your team will be reminded at the time. Uh, make sure that you dot your I's, cross your T's, because you're going to end up in an audit at some point, And you're going to make sure you pass that. And finally, you're not alone. You can leverage industry resources and vendors to help you be really successful with your resupply campaigns.